One of the most important developments in modern history is the economic rise of China. It has already had a massive impact on our world today, and in the 21st century, it is only going to have an even greater impact. It's very important to understand how China has overseen one of the most incredible examples of economic development in human history, because it also explains why we are living through a new Cold War. Why the United States, which had for decades been the world's largest economy, has taken such an aggressive posture against China. In 1820, China made up one third of the global economy. However, as European powers colonized more and more of the world in the 19th century, China's share of global GDP shrunk, and by 1950, one year after the victory of the Chinese Revolution, it only represented 5% of global GDP. However, since then, since the Chinese Revolution in 1949, the situation has fundamentally changed. According to April 2023 data from the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, China's economy today, when you measure its GDP at purchasing power parity, it's the best way to measure the size of an economy, China's economy is around 19% of the entire global economy. That is larger than the US economy, which is only around 15% of the global economy. According to IMF data, in 2017, China overtook the United States to become the largest economy on planet Earth. So what this means is that in the last 70 years, China has gone from one of the poorest countries on Earth to the largest economy on Earth. This is truly remarkable. No other country in history has undergone a kind of revolutionary economic transformation like China has. We have to understand how China was able to do that in order to understand the new Cold War that the United States is waging and why the United States has been in economic decline, whereas China is on the rise. One of the first things to keep in mind is industrialization. Because in 1949, when China had its revolution, it was a very agricultural society. It had very little industrial production, whereas the United States was the world's manufacturing powerhouse, especially considering that in World War II, the European and Japanese economies were devastated and a lot of their industrial production was quite literally destroyed by bombing. If you read a lot of the early speeches by Chinese revolutionary leaders or if you read articles in Chinese media outlets from the revolution in 1949, you can see that one of their main talking points is for the need for China to industrialize. The People's Republic of China was officially founded on October 1st, 1949. That was the date of the victory of the years-long revolutionary process. Mao Zedong famously took the capital, Beijing, and gave a speech announcing on October 1st, 1949, that the people of China had stood up. This marked the end of what is known as the Century of Humiliation, when China was partially colonized by numerous foreign powers, including the European colonial powers, the US and Japan. As an example of the imperial attacks on China during the century of humiliation, keep in mind that in 1900, there was actually an invasion of China by the so-called Eight Nation Alliance, which were eight colonial powers, including, again, European colonial powers, the US and Japan, they invaded China and they took over the capital, Beijing. And then they forced China to sign one of several unequal treaties. And this unequal treaty is known as the Boxer Protocol. And as part of it, China was forced to pay the colonial powers reparations for 39 years. And the amount that China had to pay these colonial powers was larger than China's entire annual tax revenue. 
So the 1949 revolution was not only a communist revolution. It was a communist revolution, of course, but it was also a revolution for national liberation against colonialism and imperialism. And the new revolutionary leaders of China wanted to turn the country into an advanced industrial power. On October 2nd, 1949, one day after the creation of the People's Republic of China, the state newspaper People's Daily declared that the goal of the revolution was to, quote, gradually change this backward agricultural country into a civilized and progressive industrial one. Now, obviously, that language is a bit antiquated. We use very different language today. We don't really talk about backward countries and civilized. And But this is the Chinese revolutionaries writing in their own newspaper. The point to take away is that they emphasize that China was very poor and agricultural, but they wanted to make it advanced, progressive, and industrial. They wanted to massively industrialize China. This point is absolutely fundamental because frequently when people talk about socialism, they talk about socialism specifically to mean the collective ownership of the means of production, that the means of production are what you need to produce goods and services, namely land, labor, and capital. And that certainly is the bedrock of socialism, popular ownership, public ownership of the means of production. However, if you read from the Marxist tradition, if you read the classical Marxist thinkers, a point that they always emphasized was the need to develop industry and the develop the forces of production. Because if you're a poor agricultural society, you can't simply create socialism out of nothing. You have to develop advanced industry. And this is something that China was concerned about from day one. If you read Karl Marx, for instance, he is frequently speaking about the industrial proletariat, the working class in working in the capitalist industry that was being developed in Europe when he was writing in the 19th century. He's not talking about peasants. He's not talking about farmers, although, of course, Later on, in many different socialist movements, they talk about the important alliance of the workers and the peasants. However, again, what we're talking about is the development of industry. So China, since its revolution in 1949, has always put a very high emphasis on the need to develop industry and manufacturing capabilities. In fact, China has been so successful at developing its industry that China is now today the world's leading manufacturer on Earth. No country comes close to China. Today, China represents nearly one third of global manufacturing production, over 30 percent. Now, the United States had been the world's leading industrial power until around 2010, and China overtook the United States. In the 1990s, leading up to 2000, the United States made up nearly 25% of global industrial production, whereas China only represented around 5% of the world's manufacturing. That means that in just 30 years, China has drastically increased its industrial production by six times, going from around 5% of global manufacturing to nearly one third. At the same time, the US has deindustrialized its economy and today only represents around 15% of global manufacturing, less than half of China. This point is absolutely crucial because you hear frequently people say that China supposedly is capitalist and abandoned socialism with the reforms that began in 1978 under the leader Deng Xiaoping. However, that's very misleading. China did not abandon socialism. China did not adopt capitalism. Instead, what China created was a new system that it referred to as market socialism. So the economy in China is still guided by the state. And in fact, state-owned enterprises make up around one third of Chinese GDP. 
the commanding heights of the Chinese economy are owned by the state, including the banking sector. The biggest banks in China are owned by the state. In fact, the four biggest banks on earth are state owned Chinese banks. Also, significant parts of the manufacturing sector and telecommunications and transportation sector are owned by the state. So the commanding heights of the economy remain state controlled. But what China did with the reforms is it allowed for market forces to be created in order to develop the productive forces of the economy. This meant that the state was no longer going to set the prices for all the different industries, whereas before it was the state that was determining what the different prices would be. Instead, they used a series of market mechanisms along with significant state control of parts of the economy, guiding the economy, still implementing plans every five years, the five year plans to guide the economy. So it became a socialist market economy. That's the term that China used for it. And it's not like the only model of socialism that could ever be implemented was the old Soviet model where it's a command economy and everything is planned by the state. No, I mean, there is a spectrum of different kinds of socialism, right? It's not all simply the state controlling everything. And China has experimented since the late 1970s, since 1978 and the rise of Deng Xiaoping with a series of different models. In fact, if you read Deng Xiaoping, if you read his writings, this is the Chinese leader who took over after Mao's death. Mao died in 1976, and then there was a period of transition. And in 1978, you had the rise of Deng Xiaoping. He implemented the process of reform and opening up, but it was not to restore capitalism. It was, in his words, to develop the productive forces of the Chinese economy. That is to say, to massively industrialize China, which is exactly what has happened. If you read what Deng said in 1980, he said, quote, revolution means carrying out class struggle, but it does not merely mean that. The development of the productive forces is also a kind of revolution, a very important one. It is the most fundamental revolution from the viewpoint of historical development. Over the past 30 years since the founding of the People's Republic, we have laid the basic socialist foundation in agriculture, industry, and other areas. But we have a major problem. That is, we have wasted some time and our productive forces have developed too slowly. All revolution is designed to remove obstacles to the development of the productive forces. So what is Deng saying there in this speech? He's saying that after the revolution in 1949, China had land reform and agricultural reform. All of the feudal landlords that there were these oligarchs that controlled huge swaths of land, whereas most Chinese people were poor peasants. They had no land for themselves and they were completely in poverty. It was the poor, one of the poorest countries on earth in 1949. So what happened is over that period, China had massive land reform and it redistributed land and peasants were given the ability to grow agricultural products. But still, when Mao died in 1976, China was still extremely poor and the main base for its economy was agriculture. China had developed industry, heavy industry like steel and iron and electrification because so many Chinese people, millions and millions of Chinese people didn't have electricity or clean running water. So they were trying to develop very basic industry, but China was still poor. Now, if you look at World Bank data from 1990, which is the earliest we have the data for China, and specifically, if you look at the gross domestic product, the GDP, that is the size of the economy per capita divided by the number of people per capita is per head. And if you measure it at PPP, purchasing power parity, which is the best way to measure the size of an economy, which looks at the purchasing power of the Chinese currency, the renminbi, instead of looking at everything, you know, converted into dollars. You can see that in the 1990s, China per person, because it had such a big population, it's still today, China has 1.4 billion people. If you divide the economy by the people in the 1990s, China was poorer than Haiti and Honduras and Sudan. China was an extremely poor country 
Honduras and Haiti are the poorest countries in the Western Hemisphere. And in the 1990s, on a per capita basis, China was poorer than them. However, if you look at the data today, China has skyrocketed in its economic growth. And today, China's per capita GDP, if you look at it PPP as of 2021, was nearly $20,000, over 19,000 US dollars. Whereas in Haiti, per capita GDP PPP is just over 3,000 or in Honduras, 6,000, or in Sudan, 4,000. So China has overseen the world's most incredible economic development in the past three decades, and it has done this through massive industrialization. Deng Xiaoping spelled out this strategy very clearly in his writings. He noted that China's goal was to meet the four modernizations, that is, modernizing industry, defense, agriculture, and also science, science slash technology. He criticized the Gang of Four. Those were the four influential Chinese leaders during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. And then when Mao died in 1976, the Gang of Four, they were eventually put out of power and then Deng came to power in 1978 and he done criticized them. He criticized their meaning of socialism because he's saying that basically they were trying to say that socialism meant pauperism. It meant being poor and completely agricultural and not developing advanced industry. He pointed out that Marxists have always held that socialism is superior to capitalism and that socialist countries should be able to develop their productive forces more rapidly than capitalist countries. So what Deng was saying is that socialists should be able to develop industry more quickly and more efficiently than capitalists. And if you look at the past socialist revolutions, you can see that did happen, for instance, in the Soviet Union. At the time of the revolution in Russia in 1917, Russia was an extremely underdeveloped country that was largely agricultural. It did not have a lot of advanced industry. So the Bolsheviks, they embarked on one of the largest industrial revolutions in history. And in the 1920s, and especially in the 30s, leading up to World War II, they massively industrialized their country. So by the end of World War II, in 1945, despite the fact that the Third Reich, that Nazi Germany had devastated so much of the Russian economy and the other Soviet economies. So it wasn't just Russia, also Ukraine, also Armenia and Azerbaijan and other countries, modern day countries that were part of the Soviet Union. Then their industry was completely devastated. And yet despite that, the Soviet Union had got, turned Russia from one of the poorest countries in Europe to be being a world industrial superpower. So the point is that when people talk about socialism, they frequently talk about class and trying to end the dictatorship of the capitalist class that controls the state. They talk about inequality and they talk about poverty and they talk about the need to control the means of production. But what's often left out is if you read all the old school Marxist thinkers, going back to Marx himself, they were all concerned specifically with industrialization. You have to massively industrialize your country in order to create the productive forces needed to develop socialism. You cannot develop socialism if you're simply a poor agricultural country. When Deng Xiaoping came to power in China in 1978, he understood that this was the path for Chinese development, massive industrialization. So this explains the goal behind the reform and opening up. It was not China simply becoming capitalist. This is a complete misunderstanding. What in what kind of capitalist country are all of the big banks owned by the state? All of the land is technically owned by the state. All of the massive telecommunications infrastructure and uh, transportation and other huge aspects of the economy with thousands of state-owned enterprises that guide the development of the economy. No, what we're talking about is a unique model. Again, it's not the same as the Soviet model. It's very different from the Soviet model, which was 
a, a command economy where everything was overseen by the state. In China, they did allow market forces and some private ownership, but with under the leadership of the state led by the Communist Party of China. This is how China has carried out the most massive industrialization in human history in just a few decades. Other socialist countries in Southeast Asia are adopting a similar model, by the way, including Vietnam and also Lao, which people often call Laos, but it's actually Lao. They're adopting a similar model with state-led development in order to bring about massive industrial production to develop the productive forces to set the stage needed to move to the more advanced stage of socialism. And China has always said the exact same thing. Now, when the Chinese leadership began carrying out the reforms in the 1980s and opening up market opportunities, they understood that they didn't simply want Chinese workers to be exploited by foreign corporations. Because if all they did was allow foreign corporations to come into China to exploit Chinese workers who are much lower paid, then how is that gonna help develop Chinese industry? So instead, what they did is the Chinese government required certain conditions for foreign direct investment, FDI. And this specifically meant that foreign companies had to partner with local firms in China in joint ventures, and they had to allow for technology transfer. This was a way for China to develop its own local industry, its local industrial production, and to get access to foreign technologies in order to develop its economy, and not simply have Chinese workers exploited. This led to a common myth that you hear the U.S. government constantly complain about today, which is the idea of so-called forced technology transfer. And I'm going to read here from a, a scholarly article that was written by a professor of law at Stanford University named Alan Sykes. And I'm just going to read part of this article that he wrote. Quote, Forced technology transfer is a central issue in the ongoing U.S.-China trade row. The phrase encompasses a number of different practices, but the most significant, according to various commentators, involves measures that require foreign investors in China to partner with domestic entities as a condition of making an investment, either by forming a joint venture or affording Chinese investors a controlling equity stake. These corporate structure requirements empower prospective Chinese partners to bargain for technology transfer as a condition of forming a new venture or otherwise enable them to learn the details of foreign technology through participation in the business enterprise. Here, this Stanford law professor points out that this is actually not forced. It's completely voluntary because he writes, quote, Foreign investors are free to reject such requirements and forego the associated investment opportunities. And in this sense, any technology transfer pursuant to China's requirements is consensual. So this is an example of one of the brilliant policies that China used to develop its own industry. And this is how today, in, in just you know 40 years, China has become a world leader in technological production with these massive technological innovators like Huawei that the U.S. is trying to ban now. The U.S. is trying to prevent these Chinese tech companies from taking the lead, which is why the U.S. has been imposing sanctions and restrictions, for instance, on the export of semiconductor technology to China or quantum computing parts or advanced chip making technology because China has developed so quickly, but it did not simply develop like by opening its market and privatizing everything and allowing foreign corporations to come in without any rules. No, 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 that's not what happened. China was very careful and strategic and it made sure that in return for having access to one, Chinese workers and the huge Chinese market, it required that foreign companies make partnerships with local Chinese firms in order to develop China's industrial sector.
This is one of the ways in which China has skyrocketed in its manufacturing output from, again, around 5% of global manufacturing in the 1990s to today, more than 30%, nearly one third of global manufacturing. China also accomplished this by basically becoming the world's supply chain. We, we constantly hear about supply chain issues, but really China is for much of the world, the supply chain. There was a very good article explaining this in Asia Times called Why So Much Manufacturing Still Gets Done in China. And it was written by two professors of business at the University of Toronto in Canada. And they pointed out that today in the United States, there's a lot of discussion about moving global manufacturing out of China. But despite the talk, U.S.-China trade actually reached a record level in 2022 with no signs of any slowing in the near future. This is an incredible fact that's not often discussed, that despite the constant U.S. sanctions against China and the trade war that Donald Trump started and the very aggressive rhetoric that has continued under Joe Biden, the reality is that U.S. and China trade continues to grow. And why is that? It's because the supply chain is almost entirely located in China. The article points out that since 2001, when China joined the World Trade Organization, much of the world's manufacturing base has migrated to China. Attracted by low cost labor, which is well known, cheap, low paid labor, but also favorable policies from the Chinese government, which again has implemented massive industrial policy, trying to massively increase industrial production. These policies include massive investments in infrastructure and trade capacity. So today, the U.S. is now trying to pressure all these companies to leave China. However, the article notes that despite the significant financial and political pressures, many companies are still not moving more of their production out of China. Why not? As it turns out, China has mastered the craft of manufacturing. Even though labor costs associated with production are significantly lower in other countries like Bangladesh, for instance, productivity is also lower in those countries. That is to say that Chinese workers, yes, they have higher wages and therefore they're more expensive for Western companies. However, Chinese workers are very highly skilled and that means that their labor is more productive than in other emerging economies in Asia, in countries like Bangladesh, which is where the U.S. is trying to pressure countries to, companies to move. The article explains that China has done this by essentially putting the entire supply chain in its own country, writing, China's manufacturing industry has access to a high level of agglomeration economies or ecosystem. Take the example of producing a hoodie. It's not just about the textiles needed to cut and sew the hoodie. It's also about the trims, dyes, zippers, cords, and other necessary pieces that are required for assembling the product. China has deployed a strategy that ensures the entire manufacturing supply chain is located in China and has mastered each step of the process. China even imports and processes much of the world's wool and cotton, including a significant amount of U.S. grown cotton that comprises approximately 35% of the world total. This cotton is then processed, made into fabric, dyed, and sewn into clothing and other products. They are then exported globally, including back to the U.S. as finished goods. The entire textile ecosystem for production is located in China. And this is not just the case for fabric. It's also the case for all of the components. So this is the global supply chain. Any company, basically any product they want to make, they can do within China. That is why so few companies are leaving China despite the pressure by the United States to reshore, that is go to another country, or a popular term that's really a buzzword in Washington today is friendshore, trying to pressure companies to move their operations to 
friendly countries as opposed to China, which is supposedly an unfriendly country because the U.S. is waging a new Cold War aimed at ultimately overthrowing the Chinese government and ending the socialist model, which is known in China as socialism with Chinese characteristics, which has made China into the world's manufacturing superpower. Because the other factor to keep in mind here is that as China has become the world's leading manufacturing power, the U.S. economy has de-industrialized in the neoliberal era and its economy has become more and more financialized. There was a very good article about this published in the Financial Times this June titled America is feeling buyer's remorse at the world it built. It shows how in 1965, over 55% of U.S. GDP came from the manufacturing sector, from manufacturing goods and also construction. And that, that figure has declined, especially with the rise of Ronald Reagan and neoliberalism in the 1980s. There was a significant decrease in industrialization. And we saw in the neoliberal era, as many companies outsource their operations to exploit low paid workers, largely in Asia, but also in Latin America and to a lesser extent Africa, we can see that the manufacturing percentage of the U.S. economy drastically decreased. And around the time of the 2008 financial crash, which was really the the death of neoliberalism that I mean, still today, neoliberalism continues like a zombie, but the 2008 financial crash was the end of the neoliberal era. And I, that was also the low point of U.S. industrialization and or the high point of deindustrialization. And if manufacturing only made up just over 35 percent of the U.S. economy and it has slightly increased today, it's around 40 percent. And of course, at the same time, the inverse of the industrial sector has been services, the service industry. And in the 2000s, the service sector of the U.S. economy made up almost two thirds, over 60 percent of GDP. Another graph shows employment of workers in the U.S. And you can see that in 1965, workers were employed, about one third of workers were employed in industry and specifically over one quarter were employed in manufacturing. And that, that number has declined. And again, it reached its low point in 2000, around 2008, 2009, the financial crash. And it has been stagnant at a low point of fewer than 10% of workers in the U.S. work in manufacturing and fewer than 15% work in industry. This is what a deindustrialized economy looks like. And at the same time, as the U.S. economy has deindustrialized, China has massively industrialized and become the world's manufacturing superpower. So. We need to keep those two things in mind, that the neoliberal capitalist model in the U.S. led to financialization and deindustrialization, whereas the Chinese model, the market socialist model of socialism, the Chinese characteristics led to massive industrialization, just as the classical Marxist going back to Marx himself talked about the need to industrialize an economy because you can't develop socialism without first going through industrialization. This in large part explains the new Cold War on China and why the U.S. is so desperate to destabilize the Chinese government to eventually overthrow the Communist Party of China, but also to impose sanctions on the Chinese economy and to try to suffocate the Chinese tech sector. The U.S. is waging an, a technological war, trying to destroy competitive industries in China, like in telecommunications with companies like Huawei, which the U.S. is pressuring governments around the world to ban, and why the U.S. has targeted Chinese tech sectors, like, for instance, semiconductor production or quantum computing, and now AI artificial intelligence, because China is developing its, its technology sector so rapidly and the U.S. 
which has deindustrialized and adopted a speculative rent seeking financialized model of neoliberal capitalism, the US has destroyed its own industrial base and it can't compete with China. The irony is that the very same capitalists in the United States that voluntarily moved their operations to China as part of China's industrialization strategy because they wanted to exploit cheap labor in China. By the way, another important point is that those companies not only outsource to countries like in Asia where they could exploit low paid workers, but also it was a way of union busting because in the 1970s, when deindustrialization began and outsourcing began, which also began with neoliberalism at the same time, those were all part of the same process. This is also at a moment when the labor struggle in the US was very powerful and unions were very powerful. And it is also not coincidentally the moment in which real wages in the US, that is wages adjusted for inflation, were at the highest levels they have ever been because workers had more power. They had unions to protect them. So one of the ways that big companies, especially the big manufacturing corporations like the car industry, where labor unions were very powerful, a way for those companies to break the back of unions was to outsource their labor overseas. And that's, of course, exactly what happened. They contributed to deindustrialization in the US, which weakened the US economy. And then the neoliberal model of just pumping money into Wall Street and the S&P 500 and stock speculation. I mean, the, we constantly hear from U.S. politicians to say that, oh, look how great the stock market is doing. Therefore, the economy is doing well. But the stock market and the economy are not the same thing. The real economy in the U.S. was abandoned and it just became a big bubble of financial speculation by Wall Street in the neoliberal era while China was developing its productive forces and its industrial capacity to be, become the world's manufacturing superpower. And now in the United States, many politicians have woken up to this reality and that's why they are so desperate and they're trying to change the model in the US, but they found that they basically can't do so because in the US with the this ultra extreme capitalist neoliberal model, that means that big corporations have no control, no regulation. They can do whatever they want. They control the government. They can buy politicians to serve their interests because according to the, to the US Supreme Court in the case Citizens United, corporations are people. They have constitutionally protected speech in the form of infinite donations, and they can simply buy any politician by the campaign contributions to make sure they win the elections. And in congressional races, more than 90% of congressional candidates who have more funding in their campaign win the election. So it's the best so-called democracy that money can buy. And corporations spend a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars buying those elections. The top US national security official, that is Joe Biden's national security advisor, Jake Sullivan, gave a historic speech this April in Washington in which he essentially acknowledged everything that I'm saying. This is not just my opinion. This is one of the top US government officials admitting that the neoliberal model has been a complete failure. That is the neoliberal model in which the so-called free market could control everything and the government was not allowed to intervene in the economy. And now what we're seeing is top US government officials are admitting openly that the government has to massively intervene in the economy and carry out socialistic policies in order to compete with China because, as Deng Xiaoping had famously said, the socialists were more effective at industrializing than the capitalists. And in order to compete with China now, the U.S. has to rein in parts of capitalism. In this speech, Jake Sullivan admitted that the so-called Washington Consensus failed. The Washington Consensus was the old neoliberal doctrine the U.S. imposed on Global South countries through the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, telling them to deregulate all of their markets, to lift all currency controls, to, to liberalize their capital markets, to privatize all state-owned industries, to cut wages, to cut healthcare and education spending, to allow the free market to take control of everything. And Jake Sullivan admits 
that this was a complete failure. So now he's calling for a new Washington consensus, which you can essentially say basically is a return to Keynesianism with significant state intervention in the economy. Jake Sullivan admitted that the neoliberal policies the U.S. implemented led to a massive hollowing out of the U.S. industrial base. And it also meant that by cutting taxes on the rich and implementing those policies that started under Ronald Reagan, well, actually, they really started under Jimmy Carter, but they really went to a whole new level under Ronald Reagan in the U.S. and under Margaret Thatcher in the U.K., those policies resulted in a complete failure. So here I'm going to play some important parts of this speech where he acknowledges the failure of neoliberalism and Jake Sullivan calls for a return for a return to industrial policy with the US government guiding industrial development ironically which is exactly what China has been doing for decades and to go against all of the neoliberal orthodoxy that we've been told for decades supposedly leads to high quality economic growth. America's industrial base had been hollowed out. The vision of public investment that had energized the American project in the post-war years, and indeed for much of our history, had faded. It had given way to a set of ideas that championed tax cutting and deregulation, privatization over public action, and trade liberalization as an end in itself. There was one assumption at the heart of all of this policy that markets always allocate capital productively and efficiently, no matter what our competitors did, no matter how big our shared challenges grew, and no matter how many guardrails we took down. Now, no one, certainly not me, is discounting the power of markets. But in the name of oversimplified market efficiency, entire supply chains of strategic goods, along with the industries and jobs that made them, moved overseas. And the postulate that deep trade liberalization would help America export goods, not jobs and capacity, was a promise made but not kept. Another embedded assumption was that the type of growth didn't matter. All growth was good growth. So various reforms combined came together to privilege some sectors of the economy, like finance, while other essential sectors, like semiconductors and infrastructure, atrophied. Our industrial capacity, which is crucial to any country's ability to continue to innovate, took a real hit. The shocks of a global financial crisis and a global pandemic laid bare the limits of these prevailing assumptions. Later in the speech, Jake Sullivan complains that China is a large non-market economy. He calls it non-market because he doesn't want to call it socialist. But ironically, he's wrong. China does have parts of a market economy, but it's a socialist market economy. So later on in his speech, Jake Sullivan essentially admits that because China has a socialist model and the state has guided the industrial development, it has outcompeted the U.S. And the U.S., with its neoliberal capitalist model, can't compete with Chinese socialism. So he basically says that the U.S. needs to adopt some socialistic policies in order to compete with China. By the time President Biden came into office, we had to contend with the reality that a large non-market economy had been integrated into the international economic order in a way that posed considerable challenges. The People's Republic of China continued to subsidize at a massive scale both traditional industrial sectors like steel as well as key industries of the future, like clean energy, digital infrastructure, and advanced biotechnologies. America didn't just lose manufacturing. We eroded our competitiveness in critical technologies that would define the future. In the same speech, the U.S. National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan, acknowledges that by implementing these neoliberal policies and outsourcing huge parts of the U.S. supply chain, it also weakened the U.S., not only the industrial base, but it weakened the U.S. by making it dependent on other countries as part of the supply chain. So here he admits another complete failure of the neoliberal capitalist model. And ignoring economic dependencies that had built up over the decades of liberalization had become really perilous from energy uncertainty in Europe to supply chain vulnerabilities in medical equipment, semiconductors, and critical minerals. These were the kinds of dependencies that could be exploited for economic or geopolitical leverage. 
And finally, in the same speech, Jake Sullivan admits that the so-called free trade policies and free market policies led to large parts of the U.S. having massive unemployment and poverty and inequality skyrocketing in the U.S. So in parts of the Rust Belt where they had lots of manufacturing jobs, which were very good quality jobs that were often unionized and paid well and had benefits, and those jobs all left and they were outsourced. And what happened is huge parts of the U.S. were abandoned. And now the U.S. government is admitting that, that this was a complete failure of capitalism and the state has to step in to help those people. The prevailing assumption was that trade enabled growth would be inclusive growth, that the gains of trade would end up getting broadly shared within nations. But the fact is that those gains failed to reach a lot of working people. The American middle class lost ground while the wealthy did better than ever, and American manufacturing communities were hollowed out while cutting edge industries moved to metropolitan areas. Now, the drivers of economic inequality, as many of you know even better than I, are complex, and they include structural realities like the digital revolution. But key among these drivers are decades of trickle-down economic policies, policies like regressive tax cuts, deep cuts to public investment, unchecked corporate concentration, and active measures to undermine the labor movement that initially built the American middle class. So this is the biggest irony of all. Chinese socialism has been so effective that it's basically forcing the U.S. to implement socialistic policies and to go back to the Keynesian policies that it had before the rise of neoliberalism in the late 1970s and the 1980s. Now, this is ironically the so-called golden era of capitalism in the 50s, 60s and 70s when unions were very strong. And the reason they were strong is because the U.S. government this is during the peak of the first Cold War. The U.S. government basically forced corporations in the U.S. to make an agreement with labor. There was an agreement between capital and labor that they would provide stability and prosperity for a broad base of U.S. society. Of course, let's not forget Jim Crow and racism and all of that. The point is that there was an agreement made between capital and labor that would allow some prosperity and purchasing power for workers and in return they would not have a socialist revolution because the u.s was afraid of a revolution and was waging this cold war against the soviet union at the time and the other socialist countries and actually before the sign of soviet split china and the soviet union were allies so the point is that that golden era of prosperity was a result of the u.s being afraid of the threat of a socialist revolution and today China's Chinese socialist model, which is different from the Soviet socialist model, but it's still socialism, has been so successful that it's forcing the U.S. to go back to this era and allowing some social safety net for workers, reindustrializing, allowing some unionization, ostensibly, at least that's what the Democrats claim they want, although they're not actually implementing it. And We'll see if the Republicans come back. I mean, we still see a kind of zombie neoliberalism. But the point is that we see top U.S. government officials admitting that capitalism has failed and they have to go back to Keynesianism. They have to go back to massive government intervention to prevent the worst side effects of capitalism from continuing to destroy their country and prevent them from competing with China. So we're in a very interesting historical moment. And I'm going to conclude here by going back to that article that was published in the Financial Times. This article really hits the nail on the head. It's titled, America is feeling buyer's remorse at the world it built. And it's by the Financial Times columnist Martin Wolf. And what's interesting is Martin Wolf, ironically, is actually a, a perfect example of this shift that we're talking about. Because in the 1980s and 90s, Martin Wolf was a complete neoliberal Chicago boy free marketeer. He talked about how the solution for everything was privatization and, and freeing the market and, and all of that and, and you shouldn't have state intervention in the economy. But with the 2008 financial crash, he, like a lot of former neoliberals, like Jeffrey Sachs, for instance, they had a come to Jesus moment and they all became Keynesians again. And now Martin Wolf is a Keynesian. He understands that there needs to be 
a turn away from the free market fundamentalist neoliberal model, and there has to be significant state intervention to guide the economy. And he points out the same thing is happening in the US. He notes that the United States played the decisive part in creating the Bretton Woods institutions, the, that, that, that is the IMF and the World Bank, along with the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, that is the GATT, which is the basically pushing for free markets and lifting protectionist policies like tariffs. And also, of course, the World Trade Organization, which was created much later. And the WTO was also a, a force for neoliberalism and free trade. And the U.S. basically led it. But he points out that now with the massive rise of China economically and the weakening of the U.S. economy, the situation is changing. And he says, whether we like it or not, we all live in the world the U.S. has made. However, the U.S. is now suffering from buyer's remorse and the U.S. has decided to remake it. And he mentions the speech by Jake Sullivan, U.S. National Security Advisor, in which he says that basically the U.S. is returning to the kinds of economic state intervention in the economy, the development model, going back to Alexander Hamilton. This Hamiltonian form of economics is known as the American school, or has been, it's been called the national system of economics. But the point is that this is the model that the U.S. is going back to because it can't compete with China. And the irony is that the United States constantly talks about the so-called rules-based international order. It never defines it because it really just means the U.S. order in which the U.S. makes the rules and orders everyone around. It's a colonial order, really. It's Washington's order. And we see an example here of how the U.S. is rewriting all those rules and changing the so-called rules-based order because China has industrialized much more effectively than the U.S. has. And now we see after decades in which U.S. politicians were constantly criticizing the Chinese government for having socialism, for having significant state leadership in the economy and this massive program of industrialization led by the Communist Party of China, well, now the U.S. is being forced to implement some of the socialist policies of its own. So this is the incredible historical moment we're in, and it also explains the new Cold War. This is the reason for the new Cold War. The U.S. can no longer simply compete with China. It's become the world's manufacturing superpower responsible for nearly one third of global manufacturing. And China has no intention of abandoning that role. If you go back to the graph that I began this analysis with today, it showed that in 1820, China made up 33% of the world's economy. And China has no intention of now simply going back to the century of humiliation when it was partially colonized by foreign imperial powers and only represented around 5% of the global economy. China has 1.4 billion people and they have developed their economy and they plan to continue developing. And the US is intent on preventing China from continuing to develop and being the world's economic superpower. The U.S. wants to recreate the unipolar hegemonic order, its empire that it had after the overthrow of the Soviet Union in 1991, in that moment in the neoliberal era of the so-called end of history. But it's not going to be able to do so. That's why the new Cold War is completely absurd, and it's why it's so dangerous, because the U.S. strategy is war, because they, they understand that they can't they can't outcompete China, as they say. That's why they're imposing more and more economic warfare measures, sanctions against China. And it is all, unfortunately, on the path toward conventional military war. That's the real danger. But that's the topic for another discussion. I'm going to conclude here today. It was a very long analysis, long episode, but I thought it was important to go through all of those details to talk about China's economic development and the reasons for the new Cold War and how China has become the world's industrial superpower through its socialist model, whereas the U.S. deindustrialized through its neoliberal capitalist model. With that, I'm going to conclude. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report.
Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If it's, if it's YouTube, please subscribe to help promote this in the algorithm. We also have a podcast version of every episode and you can subscribe to get all of our episodes. And if you like the work that we do here, you can support us through donations. Consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways to donate. The best way is you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash geopolitical economy. We have no institutional support. We have no big donors. We rely entirely on small donors, viewers and listeners from the grassroots who like the work that we do here. I want to thank everyone for joining me for such a long episode. I'll see you next time.